Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to public statement hearing in Public Service Commission cases number 14G0416 and 14T0360. These cases involve the application of Vermont Gas Systems, Inc. Uh, to construct a natural gas pipeline to serve the town of Ticonderoga and also an application for authorization from the Public Service Commission to provide natural gas service to the uh, International Paper Company production mill in the town of Ticonderoga. Uh, the, the purpose of the public statement hearings is to allow members of the public to make comments on these cases in person, on the record. Uh, all of the comments made tonight will be transcribed. We have our reporter with us. The transcript will be included in the record of the proceeding and will be before the commission when it makes its decision. It's important to know that uh, this is not the only way you can comment. If you know people that ha are interested in commenting who couldn't be here or prefer not to speak in person, uh, comments could be sent to the commission by mail, by email, directly through their website, by telephone. Uh, if you talk to Lorna or Sharon out in the hallway, they have fact sheets concerning this case, and in the fact sheets they have full information about other, way, other ways to submit comments. It's also important to note that all comments to the Public Service Commission are created equal. Uh, there is no priority given to in-person comments over written comments over telephone comments. All of the comments are included in the record and will be considered by the Commission. Uh, my name is David Prestman. I'm an administrative law judge with the Department of Public Service, and my job is to preside over the, uh, the hearings tonight. Um, if you are interested in speaking, uh, you don't have to have any prior preparation. You don't have to have any written materials. Um, all we ask that you do is you fill out a card just giving uh, your name, who you're representing, if anyone, uh, and your town. And we'll call um, everybody to speak in the order that these cards are completed. We started out tonight with a list because we didn't have the cards initially. So all of you who signed on the list, we have your names and we'll call them in, in order. Uh, as we indicated in the uh, notice of this hearing, we are going to begin uh, with a presentation by Department of Public Service Assistant Counsel Heather Benke, who will be explaining to you the nature of the, the filings in these, these cases and how they are going to be processed by the commission. Are we ready? Usually, Grant Smith will be doing a presentation on oh. Okay. Okay. Actually, Assistant Counsel Heather Benke will be uh, making the presentation on one of the cases, the one concerning the provision of natural gas distribution service, and Max Smith. Matt Smith. Thank you will be given a presentation on the case concerning the application to construct the pipeline. So who's going to start? Okay, due to some technical difficulties, I really hope you have some really good eyes to see the small screen <laughs> that is before you. But there is a copy of this presentation out front if anyone wants to grab a copy of it and file along, feel free. Um, basically, this presentation is to go over the Article 7 process underneath the public service law. Um, questions about the project specifically should really be discussed with the applicant. Um, this is more of the process to go over you know, how your comments can get incorporated into the record. So.
Okay, so what is an Article 7? The Article 7 uh, process was uh, created underneath public service law by the legislature back in 1970. It established a single forum for reviewing uh, the need and the environmental impacts for certain major electrical and gas transmission facilities. Underneath that statute, it required the, the applicants to obtain a certificate of environmental compatibility and public need from the Public Service Commission, along with meeting various other requirements prior to construction. So what makes a gas project an Article 7? What it really comes down to is distance and pressure. Any project, any gas line that's greater than 1,000 feet and greater than 125 PSI or more requires to go through the Article 7 process. There are a few exceptions if the project is located entirely within a state or municipal highway or street, or if it's located entirely underground in one city. And also if there's replacement of an existing facility, facility in an extension less than one mile. The purpose of the Article 7, the legislative intent, is to provide a single forum to resolve matters and interest to the state by working with citizens and interest groups of the state, local municipalities, and state agencies. If you want to see a copy of the regulations on Article 7, they can be seen on the DPS's webpage, uh, provided on the slide and also in your handout. All this information on slides and contact and get involved in the process is also available in the fact sheet associated with the project, which Lorna has probably on the table out there. So don't feel pressured if you see some small stuff on here for contact information and whatnot. whatnot. That'll all be on the other sheets out there. Um, in 1981, the Article 7 process was streamlined for gas projects less than 10 miles by adding Section 121A. Uh, what 121A did is it limited some of the filing requirements and also set a, a set timeline for review of the projects. So now there's different categories depending on the size and dimension of the pipeline being proposed. Section 122 covers gas lines greater than 10 miles in length of any diameter. Section 121A2 covers gas lines less than five miles and a diameter less than six inches. Section 121A3 is for gas lines less than 10 miles, and if it's less than 10 miles and greater than six inches in diameter. We're gonna go through some of the preliminary stuff and then we'll get some more project-based stuff towards the end of this presentation. The Article 7 review requirements, processing time and findings are dependent on the length and diameter of the pipeline being proposed. So depending on the pipe and diameter, it depends on what type of filing it gets. Article 7 applications are reviewed very similar to CEQA review. It is not exactly CEQA. It goes through a different process. But at the same time, the regulations require a full environmental impact analysis, address any public safety concerns, and community impacts. The regulations also require minimization of any impacts and to, file, and to allow for full public participation in the proceeding. The required findings for the application of the project is the basic need of the facility, the nature of the probable impacts, the location of the line that will not, the location of the line so it will not cause undue hazard to persons or properties along the line and that it conforms with applicable state and local laws and construction and operation of facilities in the interest of the state. The decision for the Article 7 certificate is uh, done by the Public Service Commission themselves. The Public Service Commission reviews the case, including the application, any transcripts from any public statement hearing. So whatever you state on the record today will be read by the Commission. It will be uh, incorporated into their decision-making process any other comments that they receive. Um, there are other ways to make comments and we'll be discussing about them later. The commission has the decisions to deny the application or grant the, grant the certificate with appropriate conditions. The condition, conditions could require impact mitigation, alternative locations, and alternative designs.
Once an Article 7 project has been approved, the applicant can proceed with right-of-way acquisition, clearing, installation of environmental controls, and construction pursuant to the approved environmental management and construction practices plan, the EM and CSP. Once the facility is constructed, restoration will begin, and which will also be done in accordance to the EM and CSP. Uh, the right of way will continue to be managed in accordance with the long term right of way management plan that's been approved by the Commission. So, let's talk a little bit about this case. Uh, the case number for this project, which is going to be very important if you submit any type of written uh, comments about this project, everything that will be tracked will be done according to the case number. The case number for this project is 14T0406. Vermont Gas Systems, Inc. submitted an application pursuant to Public Service Law Section 121A3. Uh, Vermont Gas Systems' proposal is to construct a transmission line approximately 1,800 feet of 10-inch steel transmission pipeline to be operated at approximately 1,400 pounds per square inch. In addition to that, they're also proposing approximately 3,600 feet of two density polyurethane low pressure service lines, one being 12 inches, one being 6 inches, to be operated at a maximum pressure of 125 psi. In conjunction with this, they are also proposing a meter and regulating station consisting of three buildings on a 1,600 square foot fenced area near the Ticonderoga paper mill. The project is designed to deliver 13,440 decatherms of natural gas a day to the Ticonderoga paper mill. So, this application was filed underneath section 121A3. The uh, contents of the filing required the location of the line, the description of the line, the need for the facility, description of the resources to be affected by the line, along with the environmental management and construction standard and practices for the project, and other information deemed relevant by the applicant and other information required by the Commission's regulations. Once the application was filed, the Department of Public Service assigned staff to the project to address the concerns. The Department has engineers, environmental specialists, legal counsel, consumer outreach specialists, and administrative law jobs. Um, the Department's job is to review the project to make sure it's in compliance with the regulations and uh, public service law. With this being a section 121A3, the application is reviewed compliance with public service law for deficiencies. Identification of deficiencies must be supplied to the applicant within 14 days of the filing. Vermont Gas Systems application was there determined to be compliant on September 9th. Public service law required that the commission make a determination after, after receiving a compliant application within 60 days. Um, unless uh, the commission determines that a public he hearing is required. We're here today, the commission determined that there should be a public hearing on the project. Uh, that notification was given to the applicant on September 8th. So here's the information on the uh, public hearing. I don't think we really need to go over a whole lot of that considering you're all here today. Um, along with the Department of Public Service, there are other statutory parties involved in the project, including the Department of Environmental Conservation, Department of Ag and Markets, municipalities in which the line is located, and other persons or entities that the, deem, uh, that the commission deems appropriate. So, to participate in this hearing, uh, if you're going to start taking a look at this project on a greater scale than just this public hearing today, you can access the department's webpage in which you can access all the public documents and applications related to the case uh, by searching the case number 14T0406 on the department's webpage. Any person or party or and non -part, both parties and non-parties may file formal comment on the record with the secretary. Uh, this can be submitted electronically to the secretary. Uh, her email address is on the fact sheet and also in this PowerPoint presentation. A written letter or written statement can also be delivered to the secretary of the commission with the address that's provided on here. Uh, most important thing when you guys are making any type of written application, be sure to include the case number in there so people know which case this is going to. 
Uh, additional information about the Article 7 process and Artic Article 7 regulations are available on the web page provided on the slide. Um, if there are any questions or any additional information you want to take a look at, that information is all available for you to, for you to view on their web page. And the last slide just goes over the uh, contact information for the secretary again. And you can also access the department's webpage for this case in particular and post a comment that way. Currently, all comments must be received by December 31st, 2014, unless otherwise specified by the ALJ or the secretary. But currently, the way things are, all comments need to be received by the end of this year. So January 31st, 2014. things off to Heather. Thank you, Matt. Um, I'm just going to briefly go over the um, Section 68 of the Public Service Law so you understand that process, too. So first of all, Section 68, for most of you who probably aren't familiar with it, was enacted by the legislature in 1910 and was most recently amended in 2013 to require a petitioner to obtain a certificate of public convenience and necessity, otherwise um, commonly known in our logo as the CPCN. And that's required before a company can construct a gas plant. The purpose of Section 68 is to consider the approval of the construction of a gas or electric plant that is the physical assets, except where public service law Article 7 applies, as in this case, and um, to consider the approval of the exercise of any right or privilege under any franchise. The filing requirements for Section 68 require a gas or electric corporation to show that its organizational charter empowers it to provide service, that it has received municipal consent to occupy municipal properties, that it is able and willing to render safe and adequate service, that its enterprise is financially and economically viable, and that certification would be in the public interest. If a petitioner requests construction approval, it must also describe the plant to be constructed. This case is uh, case 14G0416, and Vermont Gas Systems filed their petition pursuant to Public Service Law Section 68 for ACPCN on September 16, 2014. That will authorize it to provide natural gas service to the paper production facility of International Paper to provide that the provision of such service is subject to lightened regulation and granting the company's motion for expedited consideration. The petition process for uh, Section 68 in this case, um, I already mentioned the case was docketed as case number 14G0416, a State Administrative Procedures Act notice was published in the State Register on October 8th th this year. Department of Public Service staff was then assigned, which includes engineers from gas safety, gas policy, environmental specialists, legal counsel, consumer outreach specialists, and an administrative law judge, which is sitting here today. To participate in this art, uh, Section 68 proceeding, you can view case number 14G0416 on the Commission's website which we've provided in the materials. I'll just say it out loud in case you didn't get a copy, and obviously many of you can't see the screen here. It's www.dps.ny.gov. 
And just like the Article 7, any person, party or a non-party, may participate by filing comments with the secretary, secretary to the Commission, by email to the Secretary, or submitting a written letter. And all those comments should reference case number 14G0416. All of the comments become part of the record. The Commission will then review the record in this case, including the petition, the transcript of this state public statement hearing tonight, and any comments that are received. The Commission decision has options to either deny the petition, grant the petition with appropriate conditions. After due hearing, the Commission may grant a CPCN if it determines that the construction or exercise of a right, privilege, or franchise is convenient and necessary for the public service. The Commission must consider whether the company, the economic feasibility of the gas company, whether it is capable of providing safe and adequate service, and whether a CPCN is in the public interest. Again, you can file comments in a number of different ways by accessing the case file on the Commission's website. Uh, you can search for the case number on that website and select the Post Comments tab. You can email the Secretary. You can write to the Secretary. You can call our 1-800 number toll-free. Or um, that's about it. Um, and as Matt mentioned, all comments in this case must be received by December 31st. Thank you. I think we're ready to begin the public statement. All right. Before we start the hearing, is there anybody who would like to ask a question about what they just heard? Everybody's completely clear on all of that. We'll have, we'll have a quiz later. Well, the public interest, it, it isn't defined any, any more um, specifically in the statute than that. It's been, it has, in effect, been defined over time in the case law, but um, it's not defined in the statute. It can, it can encompass pretty much anything that would impact the public interest. Anything else? All right, let's go ahead and begin with the public statement hearing. And our first speaker, uh, when you're called, if you would come down to the podium. Oh, by the way, could everyone hear all right with that microphone? It was weak up here. Um, all right, our first speaker is Bill Grinnell. My name's Bill Grinnell, I'm supervisor for the town of Ticonderoga. I want to speak about the neighbors that we have in International Paper and Vermont Gas and say that I'm a bit astounded that these entities are trying to improve the environment which I believe is a good thing, by providing a fuel to international paper that will reduce their output of hydrocarbons in their heating plant by 50%, as the estimates are. And it's probably the cleanest, most environmentally sound option that's available. I can't understand why anyone would want to argue against that. It is, it is to all our benefits to have that happen. It is not at some small expense to international paper. It will eventually increase their bottom line. I believe that's part of the capitalist system and the very heart of democracy to make a profit. 
I don't know that there's anything evil about that. And I would like to see International Paper continue as a successful company in this area. They do a tremendous amount of good. That's what makes them such ideal neighbors. Have you driven through the Mohawk Valley and looked at town after town with shuttered, empty factory spaces in disrepair that are actually disintegrating before our eyes? International Paper had a plant right out here where this beautiful park is. They helped this community. They took away their old plant and they helped us create this park. That's a good neighbor. They provide jobs throughout the Northeast area. Not just the 600 at the plant, but all the associated businesses and logging entities and the rest of it that benefit from IP's presence. That's a good neighbor. They're trying to increase their profit margin and productivity to keep those entities and employees going. That's a good neighbor. They could go somewhere else, set up in another place where the restrictions are much less and do the same thing. We'd like to keep them here. I really feel this is for the good of the community, the greater community, be it Essex County, the Northeast area, Franklin, Clinton County, or into Vermont, Addison, and whatever. And I'm here to say that I'm happy to have IP for a neighbor. I hope the gas comes, and I definitely think it's the right thing for our community. Thank you. Our uh, next speaker is uh, John McDonald. Good evening, and I really appreciate the opportunity to speak on behalf of International Paper Company in regards to their efforts to improve their facility through the introduction of natural gas. I have served the superintendent of schools for the Ticonderoga Central School District for the past 15, or since 2000, and I'm very familiar with International Paper Company and the role that it plays in this community. The Ticonderoga Central School District serves students and families in Ticonderoga, Hague, and Putna. It is safe to say that the Ticonderoga Mill impacts almost all of our families within the school community either directly or indirectly. We have many families who are employees of the mill. We have many families who are employed by businesses that directly work with the mill. And we have many families who are employed by entities that indirectly work or benefit from the mill being here. We all know the economic impact this mill has, not only on this community, but on the surrounding area as well, including people living on both sides of Lake Champlain. The International Paper Company is critical to the economic stability of this region and as a result, extremely important in maintaining a strong educational program for its youth. During my 15 years as superintendent, International Paper Company has not only been a partner in education, but a friend. Particularly during these last few years, during difficult economic times, International Paper Company has continued to provide generous support so that we were able to maintain programs that otherwise would have been eliminated. Whether through grants, partnerships on special programs, providing in-kind services, the Ticonderoga Mill has helped increase opportunities for young people and access for kids at all grade levels. International Paper Company employees mentor our elementary and middle school students. International Company employers help our seniors with their senior projects on their path to graduation. And the list goes on and on and on. I am proud and grateful to have the partnership that we have with the mill and want to make you aware of how important this plant plays in the success of our school district. So on behalf of the Ticonderoga Central School District, 
I'd like to say that we support the efforts of the mill in this project and any other efforts that will make this a vital organization for the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. McDonald. Our next speaker is Chris Mallon. Hello, um, I'm Chris Mallon. I'm the, the, the mill manager at International Papers Mill. Uh, I'm a native New Yorker, a graduate of the State University of New York College of Environmental Science and Forestry, and, and I live in nearby Putnam, about eight miles from here. Uh, I've worked for International Paper for 28 years, nine of those years at the Ticonderoga Mill, and, and I would like to share a bit with you about the, the mill, our products, and our team. International Paper has operated a mill in Ticonderoga since 1925 when our, our company purchased a vintage 1890s mill from the Ticonderoga Pulp and Paper Company. They operated that, that, that mill, and as Bill mentioned, over here across the street until 1969 when we built a new mill, and that's our current mill being operated on the shores of Lake Champlain. Our, our site operations include a wood yard, pulp mill, recost sizing plant, a power plant, two paper machines, a converting operation, a warehousing department, all supported by a talented team of instrument and electrical and maintenance technicians, environmental, mechanical, electrical, and chemical engineers, information technology specialists, accounting, procurement, human resources, and communication professionals. The mill offers diverse career opportunities, good wages, and benefits not found elsewhere in this region. We employ approximately 615 people, and our annual payroll and benefits alone is in excess of $58 million per year. We are committed to holding ourselves to a high standard of safety and are recognized by OSHA as a VPP star site. Our commitment to operating day in and day out in compliance with all applicable environmental regulations and health and safety standards is unwavering. The Ticonderoga Mill is a fully integrated mill producing about 850 tons per day of high quality paper. The, uh, the fiber for our paper comes from sustainably managed working forests, which provides a living to hundreds of independent landowners, foresters, loggers, and truckers throughout the entire upstate region of New York and the Green Mountains of Vermont. I'm incredibly proud of the talented and dedicated team at the Ticonderoga Mill. Our hourly workforce is represented by the United Steelworkers Union. They are here tonight in strong support of bringing cleaner, more cost-effective natural gas to the mill, and you will hear from them during the course of, of this evening's proceedings. Our Thai mill team has proven time and again that their technical ability to succeed in a very competitive marketplace. Many of our team members are second and third, some even fourth generation employees, and as such, they take a great deal of pride in the history of international paper here in Ticonderoga. The natural gas pipeline proposed by Vermont Gas and presented in the application under your review is extremely important to the mill's ability to remain competitive in the future. Our energy costs per ton of paper produced are the highest among international paper mills worldwide. Conversion from fuel oil to natural gas will significantly reduce our energy costs and at the same time significantly reduce greenhouse gas emissions, a commitment of importance to international paper as well as to New York State. I respectfully ask for your thoughtful consideration and approval of this application. And again, I appreciate the opportunity to speak here tonight. I also appreciate all of those in attendance who have come in, in support of this project. Thank you, Mr. Mallon. Next speaker is Arnie Ross.
Hi, I'm Arnie Ross. I'm the president of Local 497. It's a chapter of the United Steelworkers International Union. I've been president for uh, almost three years now. I'm getting close to the end of my term. Hopefully, if I make a decision to run again, that would be a good one. But I'm here to tell you that, uh, first and foremost, I'm a papermaker. My father was a papermaker at International Papers Tide Mill for 43 years. I've been there about 21 years, and my brother's been there about 25 years. And I think we, uh, we know what we're talking about when it comes to paper making. Um, I just want to let you know that as a president of a union, I've learned that uh, you shoulder a lot of responsibility. That's for sure. Um, there's some towns, maybe some small cities. You might be familiar with them. One's Erie, Pennsylvania, uh, Lock Haven, Pennsylvania. Franklin, Virginia, Mobile, Alabama, Cortland, Alabama, and Ballstrop, Louisiana. Uh, these are names of some mills that have closed. Uh, I don't know for what reasons. I, I imagine that they're not competitive. The decision was made to close these, these facilities. Um, I've spoken to some union officials who have worked in these facilities, and this is not something that we want to go through here at Ticonderoga. I can I brought a little visual aid here. And as you'll see right here on this visual aid, we are real we're the northernmost mill on this map. Kind of sets us apart from all our sister mills. Um, I think if you look at this map, you know in various regions, you can probably come to the conclusion that we're special. One of the reasons we're special is we make the best paper in the world. There's no argument there. Uh, another thing, reason why we're special is that we, we operate inside of a state park. Now when you operate a facility inside of a state park, you adhere to some strict environmental regulations. It's kind of like playing football and we don't get penalized for 10 yards for holding, we get penalized for 50 yards. So that would probably tell you that in order to operate here, we are world-class. So we are world-class, environmentally sound facility. That's for sure. Another thing we do here at International Paper Company that I'm proud of is that uh, just recently, let me get to my notes here. I was asked to join a team and go to Fort Drum, Watertown, New York, to a job fair. <clears throat> And I'll tell you, that's probably one of the most rewarding things I've been asked to do since I've been working at the plant. Now these soldiers, they're looking for careers. They're looking to start another chapter in their life. And while I was there, I was very comfortable being around the military because I'm a former Marine. But I was, what was really rewarding about the whole trip was there was not one person out of probably the hundred soldiers that I spoke to that I was able to, uh, that I would say, I'm sorry, we can't uh, help you at this point in time. We have nothing for you. That's not true. Just about everyone I spoke to, whether it be an electrician, a mechanic, an instrument man, a manager, a businessman, a chemical engineer, uh, someone in safety, we have something for someone here at the plant. That made me feel pretty proud to be an ex-Marine and also being a paper maker. Um, I can't even tell you how much this, this, this pipeline means to us. I mean, this is like an IV for us. This is going to keep us alive. We don't want to be one of these plants that shut down, not in this community. We want, we're set apart for reasons because we're special up here. We're special people. We have everything it takes to keep this facility running to future generations. I thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Ross. Uh, next speaker is Patty Barber. Thank you very much for allowing me to speak this afternoon. 
My name is Patty Barber, and I am the chairwoman for the Pulp and Paper Workers Resource Council. We are a grassroots organization. Um, we are hourly employees who work in the forest products industry. We work on fiber supply, forest practices, endangered species, and environmental issues that impact our jobs. Our PPRC members are dedicated to the conservation of our environment while taking into an account the economic stability of the workforce and our surrounding communities. Throughout the United States, manufacturing facilities have used natural gas since the early 1990s with excellent results. The natural gas pipeline is a great opportunity for our communities to prosper in economic growth. The PPRC is in full support of the natural gas pipeline. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Barber. Uh, next speaker, Pierre Castungve. First, I just want to say thank you for taking time away from your family to be here to listen to uh, something that's very important to us, which is the Natural Gas Project. My name is Pierre Castonguay. I'm a resident of Queensbury, New York. I've worked for International Paper about 23 years, a little over 23 years. Uh, worked in different roles um, in the company, operations, maintenance, uh, engineering. Uh, many of those years have been here at the Ticonderoga Mill. Uh, what I'd like to do is just give a little bit of color more around the scope of the project. Uh, in, some of the, in, in some of the timing of things. So the natural gas project will convert one of our power boilers, our only power boiler, as well as our single lime kiln, uh, from burning number six fuel oil to being able to burn interruptible pipeline natural gas. Uh, the, the capital investment by IP is pretty substantial. It's over $12 million just in capital investments. Uh, it'll be doing things like converting six burners on the uh, power boiler and a single burner on the lime kiln it also involves some auxiliary equipment, which includes like burner management systems and other related equipment. Um, the, 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 the conversion is planned for the mills. We shut the mill down to do inspection repair and ca uh, some significant capital investments. We shut that down roughly once a year. That's our schedule. Uh, the pipeline is scheduled to be here in December of 2015, but we uh, our annual outage, as we call it, is planned for May of 2015. Now, the, the natural gas is an interruptible gas, so we'll be maintaining backup fuel uh, for during the periods of interruption. Now, with the equipment ready uh, in May, our plans are to have a compressed, a temporary compressed natural gas system, independent of Vermont gas. This is something that International Paper is pursuing. Uh, we plan to have, uh, on the startup of the mill coming out of the May outage, compressed natural gas available for a portion, um, for a portion of the uh, mill's needs. Uh, to be successful with that, where we plan to locate the, nat the compressed natural gas uh, unloading station, the uh, decompression station, we would need to be using a portion of the fuel service line that Vermont Gas will be installing. Um, this brings us to the importance of the, the timeliness of trying to get uh, the, the permit approved. Uh, so we respectfully ask for a timeliness of review and, and approval of the pipeline and the fuel service line specifically, seeing that we'll be starting up the mill in May of 2015 coming out of the annual outage, but the pipeline itself is not scheduled until December. Uh, the importance of having the temporary system, the compressed nitric gas, actually has many folds. One, it gives the chance for the mill operations and maintenance personnel to become familiar with burning natural gas in our facility. It also gives a uh, second reason. It gives, um, gives the community an opportunity to, to learn how to respond, the safety and emergency response to having natural gas in our community, working with uh, not only our on-mill site response team, but also uh, the local community in Essex County. Uh, thirdly, it also gives us a benefit of financial impact. So there is some benefit to burning compressed natural gas compared to fuel oil, even though it's not the entire amount, it's just not possible. And probably the fourth and most important one 
is by having compressed natural gas, we'll be able to fully check out all of our systems coming out of the outage in May so that we won't have to take a second more costly shut, not more costly, but a second shutdown when the pipeline's ready. So we, in some ways you could say close one valve, open another. So that just gives a little bit of color of the importance of the project to us from a scope point of view. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kassengay. Uh Next we have Bobby Carnwell. When Mr. Grinnell came across the lake earlier this year to encourage Vermont to endorse the frack gas pipeline because he said it was important to international paper and by extension to the town of Ticonderoga, I listened. After the meeting, I took the opportunity to speak to him and to tell him that I admire the architecture, the people-friendly town layout, and the sweeping vistas that strike me every time I cross the bridge, or for about a year or so the ferry, to visit Port Henry, Crown Point, or Ticonderoga. The west side of southern Lake Champlain has important scenic, historic assets, I said. These are what you should be building your future on. If I'd had time, I would have gone on to say that from everything I've read, IP will continue to be profitable, pipeline under Lake Champlain or not. The lake, however, may not continue to be an asset to this area if construction of the pipeline disturbs sediments in the lake bed, if seismic forces, which are built into the dynamics of the area, affect the integrity of the pipe, if leaks or even explosions occur. Ty is not going to return to its former glory if it continues to limp along as a one industry town in a new century when global warming is changing the landscape literally. I am here tonight because I read in the Press Republican that Mr. Grinnell said, quote, he feels that without the pipeline, which would save at least two million annually in fuel costs, the facility's future is in doubt. First, I question where he got that feeling. At a meeting in Shoreham, Donna Wadsworth, IP spokesperson, said the company was looking into alternative fuels. She was asked, so if the pipeline did not go through, your plan would be to use other sources? Her answer was yes. Her answer was not no, we will close our doors and lay off 600 people or any workers. Mr. Grinnell suggests that saving IP $2 million annually could make all the difference in the bottom line. What about the $70 million that IP is committing to spend on pipeline construction in Vermont? Sounds like it will be 35 years before they will even break even. Mr. Grinnell's feelings don't translate into reasoned economic policy. Frankly, at first, I planned to come across the lake to ask you folks, what kind of a people allow themselves to be led by a man who bases economic decisions on unsupported feelings? Then I googled Mr. Grinnell and I found that he's made these statements. Quote, I would like to see closer relationship with Fort Ticonderoga. I believe tourism is the real key to our economic future. Quote, I'll listen to anyone. That's how you learn. It's where ideas are generated. Mr. Grinnell, I learned, is engaged in out of the paper box thinking and I applaud him for that. IP has had a dominating presence in this town for almost a century. Look around at the closed businesses downtown the diminishing cultural and recreational resources along the south side of the lake. And ask yourselves, how is this one company town model working for me, for our area? I live in Vermont. I also live in the Champlain Valley. 
I want all of us to thrive in a time when climate change and pollutants threaten us all. With Mr. Grinnell, let's listen and learn from each other as we chart our future together, protecting the lake on which we all depend while keeping alert to dangers brought on by expanding our dependence on fossil fuels. Thank you, Ms. Carmuth. Uh, next up is uh, Barbara Wilson. Thank you. My name is Barbara Wilson. I live in Sharm, Vermont, and I own a small organic berry farm with my husband. Our farm is currently located on the Phase Two pipeline route. I am here this evening to share why I believe the New York State Public Service Commission should deny Vermont Gas Systems permit to offer gas to international paper. I totally get that international paper would prefer to convert and to use the gas that is pro uh, proposed to be delivered using the Phase II pipeline. A couple years ago, I too would have thought this was a good idea. Despite it crossing over a portion of our land and cutting a 70 foot wide path through Bates Hollow and up over a wooded ridge line on my neighbor's property, which will forever change the landscape. However, over the past year, countless reports have been issued that point to the fact that natural gas is not the clean gas it was once thought to be. First, one has to look at the origin of the gas. The vast majority of gas today is being extracted using what is referred to as hydrofracking. Due to the toxicity of hydrofracking as a process that although not going on in Vermont or New York at this time, the building of this pipeline would mean others bear the awful impacts. For example, five to eight million gallons of clear water are trucked to a well pad each time a well is fracked. This is water that does not return to our ecosystem. Research reveals that fresh water on our earth is a, at critical levels for human and animal health and agriculture to support our food sources. Approximately 80,000 gallons of toxic carcinogenic chemicals are used with each frac. 40 to 60 percent of those chemicals remain in the earth to migrate into our aquifers. The balance is removed and must be deposited of, and there is no safe long-term solution for their disposal. Air and water are contaminated. Illnesses are common to neurological, skin, kidney, and respiratory systems. Methane is released in the air in great quantity. Next, one has to consider the methane that is not only released during the extraction process, but also during the transmission of the gas. It is now a known fact that research published by Cornell and Harvard universities that impacts of methane to our climate is far much worse than ever believed. Methane is 82 times more potent than carbon dioxide over a 20 year span. Since the gas that would be carried in the pipeline originates from Alberta, Canada, we cannot just focus on our own area, how it might temporarily be better but we must instead focus on the overall impact that fracking and the transport of natural gas has on our climate. When it comes to climate change, we not only live in a global economy, but a global environment as well. As technology is changing and new solutions become available, we should not invest in permanent infrastructure such as this pipeline. If we work together, we can slow down the impacts of climate change before it is too late. Otherwise, if we don't, life as we know it will be forever changed. Our children will not have the luxury of growing their own food, such as organic berries, or purchasing it locally. For these reasons, I strongly encourage the New York State Public Service Commission to deny VGS's gas pipeline to New York. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wilson. Our next speaker is Amy Dosti. <laughs> Good 
Good evening. My name is Amy Dosti, and I've been an environmental engineer at International Papers Ticonderoga Mill for 16 years. I live in Ticonderoga with my family. I consider myself very fortunate to live in an area as beautiful as this and have such a rewarding career at a manufacturing facility. As an undergraduate at the University of Kentucky and a graduate student at Duke University, I came to believe that industry and environmental stewardship can go hand in hand, and I knew that I wanted to be part of that culture. Substituting natural gas for a large portion of the fuel consumed by the mill is a great opportunity to impact the mill's economic position and its environmental footprint. Replacing fuel oil with natural gas is expected to decrease greenhouse gas emissions from the mill by approximately 20% or 60,000 tons per year. And just to give you an idea, that's approximately 10,000 vehicles removed from the road every year. Not only does this project support International Paper's voluntary sustainability goal of reducing global greenhouse gas emissions 20% by the year 2020, but this project also supports New York State's climate change goal of reducing greenhouse gas emissions 80% by the year 2050. Combating climate change in New York State is important. According to New York State's Department of Environmental Conservation, signals of climate change are already visible in New York. These include things like rising sea levels and increased risks from coastal flooding and storm surges, the appearance of diseases typical of warmer climates, and an increase in intense precipitation events, including long dry spells. The potential availability of natural gas at the Ticonderoga Mill is a project with great economic and environmental benefits to the mill, the town of Ticonderoga, the state of New York, and the Northeast. I respectfully ask the Commission to support the approval of this project so that the many benefits may be realized. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Dosti. Uh, next up is James O'Brien. Uh, good evening. My name is James O'Brien, and I am the manager of Wood Operations at International Papers Ticonderoga Mill. Tonight, I'm here not as an employee of International Paper, but as a lifetime member of Ticonderoga who's concerned about the future of my community in this region of New York State. My family has been part of paper making in Ticonderoga for over 100 continuous years. I'm proud of the fact that three generations of my family have worked for Ticonderoga Pulp and Paper, and now International Paper. My family is not unique. There are a number of families in this community who have worked in the paper industry for several generations. Generations that have worked here because th these are good paying jobs that support families, communities, and this region, including both sides of Lake Champlain. At a time when New York State is working hard to bring business and good paying jobs back to the Empire State, we cannot forget those businesses that have aided our economy and the overall health and welfare of our community through the years. The natural gas project that you are here to receive comment on this evening is vitally important to the longevity of the jobs that International Paper provides to this region. No longer do these beautiful mountains which surround us provide protection from the outside world. Instead, our jobs and the health of our communities can be impacted momentarily by outside influences a world away. Support for the natural gas pipeline will help reduce the cost of powering the Ticonderoga mill, thus reducing overall operating expenses, which in turn will support international papers' continued presence well into the future. Unfortunately, my family's time in the paper industry will end with me but many others will continue to rely on the jobs International Paper provides. In closing, let me say that International Paper has been good to this community. I know it's been good to my family and me. Thank you for allowing me to register my comments and please add my name to those in support of the natural gas pipeline. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. O'Brien. Our next speaker is, I believe, 
Bill Polaronakis. Thank you, that was close enough. <laughs> um, I'm a logging contractor from this area. I've been in the logging business for 39 years. And uh, we're blessed to be in an area, a mosaic of uh, private and public lands. Um, and a large part of the economy in this region uh, is based on the forest industry. Um, IP's um, role in our industry is a, an, a, a steady outlet for a market for low-grade forest products, which is crucial for forest management. It's one of the first steps in managing forests properly um, so we can improve the stands as we go through the years in, in, in our um, operations. Um, without IP, it would be a little hard economically for us to do the job that has to be done with low-grade material. Um, let me refer to my notes here a little bit. Um, in the logging industry also, International Paper has taken a, um, both a financial aid stance and a conceptual stance in uh, improving um, forest management and uh, BMPs, best management practices for the environment, through the New York Logger Tra Training Program, uh, which I've been a part of for quite a few years now. And um, Together, um, we've created a system of trying to train loggers and improve forest practices it, it, throughout the Northeast and at both sides of the lake. And um, we feel that IP's presence in the forest industry is crucial and, and much needed. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Mr. P. <laughs> uh, the next speaker is Larry Phillips. Hello, uh, my name is Larry Phillips. I work for International Papers Ticonderoga Mill and I manage a part of the mill that recycles the cooking chemical that turns wood chips into pulp. I have a Bachelor of Science degree in Forest Management from Southern Illinois University and a Master of Science in Forest Soils from the University of Florida. Before working in my current role, I spent 13 years working as an environmental engineer at the Ticonderoga Mill and two years as a corporate environmental auditor. In addition, I spent five years working for the New York State Adirondack Park Agency as a forester and soil scientist. I'm a New York uh, logger training certified logger and I am vice president of the Essex County Farm Bureau. I pride myself in working with people that work hard. My wife Betty and I are tree farmers. We own 30 acres of private forest in the town of Scroon, and we sustainably grow trees for energy at home and for other products like pulpwood and saw timber. The forest products we sell are used to pay for taxes and to support the local economy. We've even donated homegrown lumber to fellow Farm Bureau members that experienced an unfortunate barn fire. Our working forest also produces clean water that flows to Scroon Lake and provides a diverse habitat that fosters local wildlife. My experiences in the Adirondacks are comprehensive and diverse. I understand how a ream of paper that we make at the Ticonderoga Mill is produced, from the root uptake of nitrogen and phosphorus in the forest to the production of energy it took to make it. 
to the commitment and effort it takes to maintain 100 percent environmental regulatory compliance at the mill and to work safely every day. But the coolest part of all of this is what our employees get to do with their good wages. We have parents who can afford good health care. We have parents who can afford to take their kids on special trips to Disney World <clears throat> or skiing in the Adirondacks. We have parents who can afford to pay for their kids to have wonderful athletic and other developmental opportunities. We have parents who can afford to send their kids to college at great schools such as Middlebury, Clarkson, SUNY colleges, or even out-of-state uh, schools such as University of Florida. And the best part of all this is that the kids get to be raised in the Adirondacks. It's amazing, and it needs to continue. For that to happen, the Ticonderoga Mill needs to win. Our mill provides tremendous opportunities, <coughs> pardon me, not only to its employees and their families, but also for our region to continue to, 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 continue to provide these opportunities we must be competitive in the marketplace. High, ener high energy costs need to be overcome. To win, we must lower the mill's energy costs. Natural gas is how we do this. Thank you for your consideration of this very important project. Thank you, Mr. Fellows. Uh, next up is Randy Douglas, um, Chair of the Board of Supervisors for Essex County. Thank you, and thank you for giving us this opportunity to speak on, on behalf of, of this decision-making process. I'm here to say 100% uh, the unanimous Board of Supervisors, our 18 towns, have give our unanimous support behind Vermont Gas to provide a natural gas pipeline to international paper. I'm here to tell you that I came from a town, I come from a town that in 1970 closed. It was a paper mill. And I can tell you that in the little town of Jay, we're still recovering. I can tell you that climate change has hit us, yes, for sure. We've had two major floods. Irene wiped us out about uh, three and a half years ago. So I see firsthand what floods and climate change can do to you. But I can tell you also that two years ago, Donna asked me to take a tour of the facility in Ticonderoga. I'd never been in my international paper. I took a tour. I can tell you that I was very happy, very proud of, for, of what international paper has created for jobs, hard working, good paying jobs for all the residents of Essex County. 600 good paying jobs. When I left there, I got to tell you, I was a little bit jealous because I started thinking about back in 1970, what that could have been for us. We closed. The J&J Rogers Company, very famous company, closed. That, no, they haven't come right out and said, no, we would close of this lifeline, and that's what I call it. This is a lifeline. Mr. Ross called it an IV. I agree with him. It's a lifeline for an international paper. International paper has been good neighbors to all of us in the North Country. I've worked very hard um, to improve um, economic opportunities all throughout the North Country. But I've got our North Country Regional Council um, chairperson, Mr. Gary Douglas, here with us today. We've been very fortunate to be successful and provided economic opportunities and focus on tourism. We've been very uh, thankful for Gary's leadership and Tony Collins, and Collins from Clarkson University. But as we focus on tourism, which is, Essex County is full of tourism opportunities. But we can't, stay, we can't survive alone on tourism. We need good paying jobs. We need economic opportunities. We have a governor that is focused on the North Country, and Governor Cuomo is focused on the North Country in providing good jobs. What it would mean if international paper picked up and left, it would mean a hard, hard, um, impact on all the residents of Essex County. We come from a county with 40,000 people. There's 600 employees, and not all from Essex County, but lots. It would have a huge impact on us economically. We have to live here. 
It is a, a great tourism opportunity to come and visit the North Country and all of Essex County, Lake Placid, Ticonderoga, Jay, Mariah, Scroon Lake, and Crown Point. It's, yes, but we still have to raise our families here. We have to have our schools. We have to have our volunteers for emergency services. We have to take care of our veterans. 127 veterans work at International Paper, 25% of their workforce. We are here to provide them from when they come home, from providing, making sure that our country is safe. That's what International Paper does. They've been a good neighbor, not just to Essex County, but all of the North Country. And I'm very proud to say that we're in full support from everything that I've read, you know, they've tried things. It, you look at the, being environmentally sound. More emissions come from wood, oil, rubber. This is a safe, environmentally sound decision-making process. In over 20 years, it will have, from my, from my notes, 100 million tons less in green, greenhouse emissions. I think this is a double whammy. This is good decision making. It's going to keep us um, be able to provide good jobs here in Essex County. It's going to be able to let our, our, our residents have a good place to live and, and raise our children. And I think it's environmentally sound. So 100% the Essex County Board of Supervisors certainly stands behind Vermont Gas and International Papers proposal to bring natural gas underneath Lake Champlain. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Douglas. Uh, our next speaker is, I believe, um, Tom Scazafava, <laughs> Supervisor, Town of Mariah. Good evening. Thank you for this opportunity. I'm certainly glad that the lady from Vermont Google Grinnell's name instead of mine. <laughs> let me uh, <laughs> let me begin by saying that Arnie Ross, uh, the union president, that was great. It was from the heart, and I'll tell you, it's, it's going to be hard to to top the words that you said here this evening. I was born in Ticonderoga at Moses Lonington. I've been a lifelong resident of the town of Mariah. I've been town of Mariah supervisor. I was elected in 1985, and I've held that position um, throughout the years. And through my years in public service, I have become very familiar with the International Paper Company mill located in Ticonderoga, and also the importance that this mill has for our entire region. Someone mentioned earlier that this mill operates within a park. This mill operates within the Adirondack Park, which is one of the most environmentally sensitive regions in this country. And they've done it for, for as long as the park has been here. And they've done a great job of it. They've received numerous awards through the years for their leadership in regards to the environment, for innovative technologies, to reduce any neg negative impacts that that operation may have had on the environment. The proposed natural gas line for the continued operation of this mill is critical in many ways. And in fact, as been, has been pointed out here, has a less adverse environmental impact than the oil that they're currently burning. Many of my constituents and their families, including my own family, depend on their living, our livelihood, through International Paper Company, as has many generations before them. And as someone just pointed out, what do they do when they get that paycheck? They spend that money. Where do we spend that money? We spend it at the local businesses, we pay our school taxes, we pay our property tax, we support our volunteer organizations, and the list goes on. In the Adirondacks, we not only try to bring in new jobs, when we have the time to do that, because believe me, every day it's a struggle to just try and retain the jobs that we have here. And that's been a major focus. The Ticonderoga Mill is, I believe, Essex County's largest private employer. 
in the spin-off economy that this mill provides for our entire region and yes, Vermont. I spend my money in Vermont, quite a bit of it, is critical for this area. I also come from a community that once had an industry, Republic Steel Corporation. They mined in the town of Moriah. That's why we exist. They shut down in 1971 for summer vacation and never reopened. The community was devastated. Still are to this day. You never recover. And if International Paper Company were to close this mill in Ticonderoga, not only Ticonderoga would be devastated, the entire region would be devastated. And that's a fact. And if you don't believe it, come take a ride through my community. Tourism, Lake Champlain, the view from Vermont, when you, absolutely, it is beautiful. But let me tell you something, that don't put food on the table. I support this project as all of the governing boards in Essex County, and I believe in this entire Adirondack region also supports this project. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Skazofava. Our next speaker is Charles Harrington, Supervisor, Town of Crown Point. Thank you for providing us the opportunity to demonstrate our concerns regarding the proposed natural gas line pipeline. Unlike the hearings in Vermont, Tonight, you are hearing from area natives whose livelihood is ultimately in your hands. In 1957, I was an adolescent living in a small town 100 miles south. My neighbor and his wife decided to take me for a ride to Fort Ticonderoga. The road to the fort led right through this very town. Getting to about this very spot, I thought I would die. The stench brought tears. If you looked back in time and a little east, across the road, this very road, there was that belching paper mill. I laid awake that night and many other nights wondering how kids dared go out into the streets. Soon thereafter, allegations surfaced implicating IP with polluting the lake. And after these allegations were made, a new mill was built whose papermaking processes still produced an odor but not the permeating stench of the antiquated mill that has since been transformed into a panoramic town park. Then, in the late 80s, IP changed its processes, and as a result, the air has been so greatly improved that one can drive close to the mill and witness no odors. Wanting to improve on its margin of profit and continue its environmental endorsements, IP has pledged to energizing itself with natural gas. Yes, natural gas is a pollutant, and yes, it is far better than coal or oil. And natural gas is safer, more controllable, and a product of North America. It's just the next best step with the strength of economic longevity and a dedication to environmental stewardship. And when a better, safer energy or an improved papermaking process is introduced, IP will be there. So we have safeguards, a good neighbor policy, economic credibility, and 
a symbiotic allegiance to the forestry industry. People on the Adirondack side of Lake, Lake Champlain have had to alter their means of existence several times during the last century. When dairy farms were mandated to change from milk cans to bulk tanks, most of the dairies in Crown Point ceased to operate. Two milk plants and one cheese plant were also forced to close. Survival opportunities were left to logging or employment at IP. When the Northway opened, the tourist cabins in the Champlain Valley closed their doors, leaving the owners to develop a different means of, of survival, be it logging, IP, or employment across the lake. Soon thereafter, Frontier Town closed its doors, leaving another large gap in employment opportunities. Did you notice Lowe's? Did you notice the empty Main Street storefronts? Contemplate the situation if IP were forced to close. Modern infrastructure is the key for any community's future. Industry will not invest in an area with a lack of adequate infrastructure. With the lack of industry and a vibrant business sector, the inhabitants of Crown Point are forced to pay higher taxes to cover the educational, health and welfare, along with the transportation needs. Perhaps someday, Crown Point will be the recipient of natural gas and as a result, become attractive to industrial and business investment. In summary, natives of the Adirondack side love and respect their land and lakes as much as the natives of the Greens. We all have to be stewards, so those who come after will bear witness the beauty, the charismatic charm, and the sacredness of the Adirondacks and the Greens. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Harrington. Uh, our next speaker is Gary Douglas, co-chair of North Country Regional Economic Development Council. Thank you. Um, I'm here in two roles uh, this evening and speaking of both of those roles uh, as president of the North Country Chamber of Commerce, which represents more than 4,000 employers across Essex, Clinton, Franklin, Hamilton, and Northern Warren counties, uh, and as, uh, as co-chair of the North Country Regional Economic Development Council, uh, which I'm pleased to serve on with several of our folks, uh, including uh, uh, the, uh, the chairman of your county board um, in, in the work that we're doing. Uh, the world of economic development is most typically thought of uh, as the task of bringing in, facilitating, supporting new employers and new jobs. That certainly is part of economic development. Uh, and by the way, contrary to uh, one set of remarks earlier, uh, the North Country Regional Economic Development Council uh, is, has been, and will continue to work collaboratively with Ticonderoga on that front as well. Uh, we are not wedded to being a one-company town here in Ticonderoga. It is not a one-company town. And thanks to the collaborative work with the support of International Paper, we have new employers here, such as Adirondack Meat Company. We have new investment at Fort Ticonderoga, Siegel Music Colony, and other tourism attractions in the area. That's part of the overall agenda. But the entire agenda doesn't work if the single greatest employer, International Paper, and its synergy with the renewable resources of the Adirondacks and the traditional home-based e economy in the nearby mountains uh, of logging and wood products uh, is undermined. It all is a mosaic. Uh, and we're not going to abandon one for the other. We're going to do all of the above. Uh, and that's, uh, that's the track that the Regional Council is on. Um, but more importantly, at the end of the day for economic development, particularly in areas like the North Country, Yes, you bring in the new things, you celebrate those, you welcome them, 
uh, and they do hopefully diversify things for you. But let's always be sure that we value, support, and nurture the existing employment base that's here. Too often we've waited too long, taken things for granted, whether it's an Air Force base, whether it's a pharmaceutical company in Rouse's Point, whether it's a paper mill in all Sable Forks, and then they're gone. Uh, it's too late if you, if, you, if you wait until they're saying we're going. You don't get to keep them then. It isn't an option then. Uh, you've waited too long. So the name of the game really is productivity and competitiveness. Uh, and if you aren't paying attention to the ways that you need to work with a company like International Paper in today's world in terms of always helping them to enhance in every possible way their productivity and their competitiveness, you're kidding yourself that the day won't come when something's going to change, no matter how things may look now. There's going to be a merger, there's going to be an acquisition, there's going to be a new global competitor from somewhere uh, undercutting them in the market, there's going to be some new technology that somebody gets out ahead of them on, and suddenly there's a decision within the company, we've got to shake out some capacity, we've got to save some money, we've got to cut corners. Let's look at the competition internally. Two layers of competition. Competition within a global company amongst the plants that it owns, and then competition with all of the external uh, providers of the uh, similar product that they produce. Um, now, one of our friends from Vermont seemed to be obliquely criticizing international paper that they weren't making threats and weren't posing intimidation. They weren't saying we're going to close if we don't get our way. Well, for heaven's sakes, let's compliment them for that. They are a responsible, good citizen who is not engaging in that kind of behavior that's not trying to extort tens of millions of dollars out of the state of New York to build a pipeline for them under threats that they're leaving. They are doing what they have always done, working positively and collaboratively with the community in the region to try to solve problems, to try to stay on a track where they can remain competitive and productive going forward. Thank you. That's a good thing. That, that's something to compliment them for. International Paper is a quality employer. It is an employer which has shown consistently through the years it values people, it values communities, it values the environment. Now, unusually perhaps for a president of a chamber of commerce, I'll be the first to say, there are too many corporations, global corporations, American corporations, who have forgotten those three things. They no longer value people, they no longer value communities, they no longer value the environment around them. Uh, and they're paying a toll for that, and they're going to pay a greater toll from that. International paper is not that kind of company. Uh, and we thank them for that, and that's why they deserve support uh, in the mission that they're on today. Now, one of the, uh, the other key things that we've heard and seen evidence of here tonight is that they have constantly, and this is one of the defining differences in so many other plants that we've lost here in the North Country, they have consistently made major investments in this plant to do everything they can to keep it modern, productive, and competitive. And this is simply the next step in that. Uh, they have done everything else they can do. And I know they will continue to do it. But the only way they can address their exceedingly high energy costs uh, and their compliance costs in terms of their emissions uh, is through this project. Uh, and this project in one fell swoop uh, gives us something that's in the public interest. Uh, in general, it's in the North Country's interest. It's in the interest of the Adirondacks. It's in the interest of the state of New York. Um, I, I, with both roles, once again, on behalf of the Chamber of Commerce, on behalf of the North Country Regional Economic Development Council, which in its very initial plan for this seven county region four years ago, identified this project as one of the high priorities for the entire seven county region and has reaffirmed that every year since. Uh, we call for the, the swiftest possible approval of this permit uh, and for all other pending permits and approvals needed uh, so we can continue to work positively with this very positive employer to maintain a diverse uh, and uh, prosperous economy for this community. Uh, without this piece, the rest of it doesn't work. Yes, we want the rest too, but the rest of it has to rest on a bed of quality employment. Manufacturing is that employment. Thank you, Mr. Douglas. Our next speaker is Bill Quinn.
We can come right back to them. Um, so we'll go now with um, James Whitford. Good evening. <clears throat> My name is James Whitford. I'm a lifelong resident of Ticonderoga and been em employed by International Paper Company for 12 years. I'm also an officer of the United Steel Workers Union Local 4-497 here in Ticonderoga, one of the two local labor unions that represent the employees of IP Ticonderoga Mill. Tonight, on behalf of my union brothers and sisters who represent our two locals, I stand in support of this project. In our facility, we currently have some third and fourth generation employees who proudly carry on a tradition and a legacy. As a second generation employee of the Ticonderoga Mill, my experiences with international paper have spanned more than just my time as an employee. My father was an employee of the Ticonderoga Mill for 23 years prior to his death in 1985. His hard work and the hard work of his union brothers and sisters helped to position our mill for future success and allowed us to be vital to the economy of our community. Their dedication and the dedication of the current workforce together have paved the road to success and stability as we continue to remain competitive in our business. Now it is our turn once again to work on making our mill competitive for the future opportunities it will provide to our children and our grandchildren. Prior to my employment with International Paper in 2002, I had worked in a variety of production jobs in various industries in both New York and Vermont. Though most of those companies were well-respected and reputable employers, no one of them set their standards to safety and environmental conservation as high as International Paper. This is made very evident to you upon your first week of employment with a company, and it is reinforced daily through various programs and training. Though my, through my involvement with the health and safety committees and labor management relations, I have per personally witnessed the overwhelming efforts of our project planners and engineers in their efforts to ensure this project's success. But it's not always about this project. <clears throat> it's about any project. Whenever our team has been challenged with a particular task, the level of commitment and involvement exemplified by both hourly and salaried employees is representative to the level of dedication here in Ticonderoga. I am confident that when this project is complete, International Paper Ticonderoga Mill will have all of its I's dotted and all of its T's crossed. We will continue to operate as we always have while reducing our, our carbon footprint on the environment by the use of natural gas. Our members will continue to be dedicated to the health and safety and hold environmental conservation in high regard. We must do this to ensure future successes to our facility and community. In closing, I strongly encourage you to consider the approval of this project for the future livelihood of our approximately 600 proud and committed members of the Ticonderoga Mill team. Standing before you today, I am proud to call myself a member of that team and look forward to the continued successes of, of our facility. By approving this project, you can help position us for future opportunities for the next generation of Ticonderoga Mill employees, many of whom will support local economies here in New York and Vermont. Thank you for all of your attention and the opportunity to speak to you this evening. Thank you, Mr. Whitford. Is Mr. Quinn back? Yeah. Ah, there we go. Hello, my name is Bill Quinn. Most people here know me, I think. I'm a mechanical engineer at the mill, and I don't have any notes, so I'll do the best I can. Um, I'm speaking not only as an employee of IP, but I'm also speaking as myself. And one of the things I think would be good for us to consider, something we don't think about a lot, and that is how blessed we are to live in the modern industrial world. If you look back at medieval times before industry, before the Industrial Revolution, most children didn't live beyond age five or six. Not a lot of people lived beyond age 40. 
There was a writer back in those days who said, life is nasty, brutish, and short. You may have heard that quote before. With the Industrial Revolution, the world has really been revolutionized. My dad is about to turn 83. That would not have probably been possible if he'd lived two or 300 years ago. Medical innovations, um, heat for your house from fossil fuels, um, affordable transportation. I bet all, everybody here probably got here with fossil fuels in their cars. Um, comfort in old age, health in old age, universal education from paper. We are blessed to live in the modern industrial world. And I don't think we should forget it. So I am completely in favor of the pipeline. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Quinn. Our next speaker is Fred Hunston. Thank you. My name is Fred Hunston, Sr. I'm on the town council. I'd like to speak for myself and my family. My father went to work for International Paper in 1942. He retired, I believe, in 1965. He lived to be almost 101, so uh, he had a great life. Uh, my brothers worked for IP. I think it's a tremendous opportunity for everybody that lives in this area. I definitely am in favor of it. International Paper has helped many, many different organizations. They've helped the fire departments, they've helped the uh, uh, youth program that I am uh, chairman of, they have helped many other organizations, like I say, and I definitely am in favor of this. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hunston. Um, the next speaker is Michael Marwell. Mike Marnell from Screw and Lake, <clears throat> I'm a supervisor, I've been for three years, I've been in town politics since uh, 1978, so I've uh, seen a lot of things go up and down. But speaking on behalf of the town board and the majority of the, the, the residents of Screw and Lake, I uh, approve and uh, hope that the gas pipeline that gets approval is expedited. Uh, People talk about pollution, you know, and on the way over here, I was thinking, I, I grew up in Ticonderoga, been screwing labor since 1967. But I'm not worried. I'm, we've got great government agencies control uh, pollution, park agencies, DEC. But what really troubles me kind of come over to think it, a little town of Ticonderoga or would need, I counted probably 12, 15 law enforcement officers to, to oversee a public hearing, if that's the quality of life is going down, that's what we got to stop. I don't, I'm not worried about the pollution, but if we get to a point where we can't have a public hearing without having uh, a platoon of uniformed officers, uh, there's changes that we've got to make. That will ruin our, our quality of life. But I strongly urge that this rule is granted uh, not only employees that you see working in the mill benefit, but the spinoff of logging equipment dealers, chainsaw dealers, goes on for miles and miles and miles away from Ticonderoga. So, so uh, thank you. Good evening, my name is Walt Lender. I'm a resident of Ticonderoga and have been for about the past 40 years. <clears throat> my wife and I are raising our, our children here in Ticonderoga and we're local business owners. Um, I'm also a member of the, uh, the uh, Ticonderoga Mills uh, Community Advisory Committee, uh, which is sort of a diverse group of, of uh, residents from both sides of the lake who are sort of the eyes and ears of, uh, of the mill in the community and try to give feedback uh, as needed to the, uh, to, the, to the mill from uh, sort of taking the pulse of the community. 
International Paper Company's Ticonderoga Mill is very important to Ticonderoga, both for the, econo the economic benefits, um, the, the job creation, uh, and in general, it's a great corporate citizen. It's very responsible and very generous to the organizations in the area. And um, honestly, we could, not, we could not have as vibrant a community if we did not have as generous a corporate citizen as, as we do have in uh, International Paper. Uh, I strongly urge that the, uh, that the Public Service Commission, uh, that this agency approves the application before you. And um, I know that uh, we will continue to support Ticonderoga, uh, International Paper Company's Ticonderoga Mill. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Lender. Our next speaker is Randy Martin. My name is Randy Martin, and I'm from Cornwall, Vermont, and I'm not an activist. I'm not an environmentalist. I refer to myself as a reluctant activist. I have never won, like, even a scratch-off ticket. I had the luxury of having my property have the proposed pipeline proposed on it twice, once in my front yard and now out in my, the back of my farm. I hear um, talk here of, of what a good corporate citizen IP is, and, and it sounds like they are. Uh, on the other hand, Vermont Gas, our own Governor Shumlin has said they were a good corporate citizen until this project started. And he has been very disappointed in the actions that they have taken dealing with landowners such as myself. I have, there's two proposed lines across my property. If one is chosen, I will have 44 acres of land that will be rendered useless. Myself, along with almost all the landowners from Cornwall and Shoreham, will not have access to any of this gas. The majority of it will be coming to IP with a few smatterings in the villages of Cornwall and Shoreham. Eventually, my land will probably be taken by eminent domain. And I assume that many of you here are landowners. And I just would like you to think about, we've talked about how badly the mill needs the, the pipe, but we haven't talked about how it's getting here. It's going across my land. It's going across my neighbor's land. There is not a one of us that wants this pipe on our land. And to have somebody knock on the door and say, hey, we're putting a pipe in. And we have no, no choice other than what the jurisdiction bodies dictate. And I guess, you know, when you go home tonight and you go into your house, think about if somebody knocked on your door and said, hey, I'm going to take your land because somebody else needs it. it it's not a very comforting feeling when you go to bed. Um, I guess the, the other thing that, that concerns me, and it, it hasn't really been discussed tonight, is, is the, the drilling under the lake. There's very little oversight, from what I can tell, on the Vermont side. I don't know what the oversight is here, but this is a drilling that's going to be close to a mile long underneath the lake by a company who's never done anything this size. And who's watching? Nobody in Vermont that I know of. So I think you know, that's something that, that you need to consider when you're considering all this. And then just a couple of things that, that I pulled out of the, the filings um, was that Mr. Grinnell did you know, talk about the 600 workers. And, and the future of the, of the mill is in doubt. Well, Donna and Pierre both said that they're switching to natural gas this spring. So regardless of what happens, natural gas is going to be at that plant. And who knows how long natural gas is going to be the flavor of the month, the cheap darling child. Will it be the, the 27 years that, that the contract is with Vermont Gas? And then if it isn't, that pipe's in the ground? There, there's... there's no remedy to, to fix that once it's in. It, it doesn't go away. 
Um, and, I, and I guess, you know, the, the facilities development agreement is a 27-year agreement. Stated in this filing, Vermont Gas believes that the project is adequate, adequately engineered to meet those needs and that adequate gas supplies exist for the next 10 years. What about the other 17 years? Where's the gas coming from? So I would re request that you deny this petition because it's not convenient or necessary to the landowners who are asked to host this project. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Martin. Our next speaker is uh, Robert Diedrich. I've been a resident of Ticonderoga all my life, an educator and a coach in the local school system for three decades, and most recently with the retired supervisor for the town of Ticonderoga for 10 years. I know this town. The pulse of the people in the community, the economic engine that drives this town, and its strengths and weaknesses. And I can unequivocally state that International Paper Company has a long-standing history in our town has been a pillar in this community and has been one of the foundations that helped this area thrive. If you would indulge me, I would read a small section of a book regarded as the most accurate and thorough book on our local history and shares Ticonderoga International Paper Company's relevance to this area. This book is titled Ticonderoga Patches and Patterns and I quote, the genesis of the paper industry in Ticonderoga is long, and by 1900 there were five pulp and paper mills located here and were owned by International Paper Company. So you see, International Paper Company, for over a century, has been the economic engine that would drive this community, and not just this community, but the greater Ticonderoga area, including workers and raw materials from across the lake in Vermont. But it is not just the economic livelihood that drives this argument to allow a natural gas pipeline to International Paper Company. It's the obvious stark reality of switching from number six fuel oil to natural gas. But I had to ask myself two questions. What really is natural gas? And what is number six fuel oil? I've never seen number six fuel oil. I don't even know what it is. In my research, I found out that natural gas is the cleanest, safest, and most useful form of all the energy sources. It is colorless, shapeless, and orderless in its pure form and gives off a great deal of energy. Compared to other fossil fuels, natural gas is cleaner burning and emits lower level of potentially harmful byproducts in the air. In contrast, number six fuel oil is a high viscosity residential oil requiring preheating to 220 to 260 degrees. This is a sample of that number six fuel oil. It's high viscosity. It needs to be preheated in order to really be effective. That alone, I would imagine, would require some tremendous amount of energy just to heat it up. I also had to ask myself, what is a res residual? And I found out that a residual means the material remaining after more valuable crude oil has been boiled off. The resulting residue contains various undesirable impurities. What more needs to be said? But as an educator, I know that this visual is worth a thousand words. And I would ask you, and I would ask anyone, why would you be ejecting natural gas to number six fuel oil? It doesn't make a lot of sense. I found with interest a paragraph today in the Plattsburgh Press Republican that stated that environmental groups in the Green Mountain State were opposed to the pipeline extension on the grounds that it would continue a use of fossil fuels. Without being disrespectful to those people, 
unless they rode a boat, flew by a glider, or rode a bike, they were they're guilty of burning fossil fuels. But the burning question for me is really what fossil fuel makes the most sense for use in our environment, for the residents of the greater Taganoga area, for international paper company. It is without argument natural gas, a clean, safe fuel which gives off a low level of harmful byproducts to the air as opposed to the high, thick oil with harmful residuals, many which have to be captured by smokestacks at an exorbitant cost. I implore the state of New York's Public Service Commission to grant and bless this natural gas pipeline proposal, and I thank you for the opportunity to be addressed today. Thank you, Mr. Diedrich. We now have just two more speakers and we will be done. So if there is anyone here who is interested in speaking uh, but hasn't signed up yet, please do so. See either Lorna or Sharon in the back of the room. That's Sharon with your hand up. <laughs> and fill out a card if you'd like to speak. Otherwise, we just have two more. And the next is Willie Janeway of the Adirondack Council. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you very much. And I appreciate the whole team from PSC coming up to Fort Ticonderoga, coming up to the town Ticonderoga, and also for coming up to the Adirondack Park, just this magnificent national treasure that we do have here. The Adirondack Council is a privately funded, not-for-profit conservation organization dedicated to ensuring the ecological integrity and wild character of the Adirondack Park. This is the largest park in the contiguous United States. We envision a park with clean water, with wilderness areas, clean air, working forests, and vibrant communities. The park is strongest when we have all of those things. We appreciate the opportunity to address you as you consider whether to support the conversion of the International Paper Mill in Ticonderoga from number six fuel oil to natural gas. Number six fuel oil, also known as grade C bunker oil, that change to natural gas will result in a dramatic drop in air pollution from the mill smokestack from New York and also for downwind Vermont. Number six is the heaviest of fuel oils. As has been mentioned, it requires heating to more than 200 degrees before it can be used in furnaces and boilers. Yes, natural gas is cleaner than fuel oil. It's estimated that sulfur dioxide emissions will decrease from 700 or by 700 to 900 tons per year, or an 84% reduction after the switch. This would be welcome news. Sulfur dioxide emissions contribute to acid rain and smog. Some of us have spent our lives fighting acid rain and pollution, both for the environmental benefits, but also for public health reasons. The Adirondack Park has suffered for these for decades. This smokestack is the largest stationary source of sulfur dioxide in the entire Adirondack Park. It's estimated that the fuel switch will reduce international papers, smokestack emissions of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases by 27%, as well as its emissions of fine particulates. These are public benefits, and it's important that the record that you make your decision on reflect these public benefits. Other public benefits, in addition to the ecological and public health reasons, we are also concerned with the future of the mill. It is the largest and most stable employer in the Adirondack Park, as has been mentioned, more than 600 employees. Yet like every paper maker, it's facing fierce international competition. Reducing costs in ways that don't affect wages and that benefit the environment will help the community and the Adirondacks survive. In closing, the record that the PSC uses to make its decision should include the positive air quality and public health benefits that the plant conversion can provide, the environmental benefits and economic boost to the Adirondack Park and our downwind neighbors. We, the Adirondack Council, support international papers investment in a cleaner, more sustainable plant in the Adirondack Park. The, confusion, confusion, the conversion excuse me, from fuel oil to natural gas will be good for air quality on both sides of Lake Champlain. The Adirondack Council supports the plant conversion. The Adirondack Park was created more than 100 years ago. We support wilderness, we support communities. The park works best when we have both. 
I hope the press makes notes that things have changed a lot in the Adirondacks over the last few decades. I hope the press and others make note that we have multiple elected officials speaking about the importance of environmental stewardship. Thank you very much. I hope people also note that we have an environmental scientist, other environmentalists, speaking in favor of communities, making sure we have a strong community for the Adirondacks. When we have both, we all benefit. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Daly. Uh, and now batting ninth is Mr. Dennis. That's either Gingles or Jingle. <laughs> Gingles, all right, thank you. Good evening. I appreciate this opportunity to express my opinion and interest in supporting the natural gas pipeline project. This project is important to the long-term viability and sustainability of international papers, paper making business in upstate New York. My name is Dennis Jingles and I'm a forester employed by international paper. I've worked as a forester for international paper for over 35 years and I've been working in Ticonderoga for the last seven years. I am also serving as chairman of the Empire State Forest Products Association. My current re responsibilities include wood procurement for the Ticonderoga Mill. Wood fiber is our largest raw material purchase to make paper. Our fiber needs include purchases of round wood, chips, and fiber, fuel, fiber for fuel. To procure these wood products for our mill to make paper, we contract with nearly 100 vendors across the tri-state area and within a 150 mile radius of the mill site. These vendors in turn contract or employ another 150 plus producers that help to harvest and produce various products we, uh, we purchase. Each of these producers may work with a team of two or more people that also earn a livelihood from the forest products industry. When totaled together, they are over 600 people, including woods workers, truckers, and support staff that are involved in supplying our wood fiber furnished needs. And this total does not even include the landowners that provide stumpage to loggers uh, that is produced into pulpwood and purchased by our mill. This network of vendors, loggers, truckers, and landowners that help supply this mill, also our customers to all our local business is business communities in the wood basin. These people buy their equipment, tires, parts, oil, fuel, food, clothing, etc., from all our local businesses. Our local businesses are supported through all these sales to the workers and stakeholders to our industry. This industry support network and this mill are dependent on each other for their economic viability. The loggers and truckers need this mill to mark their low-grade wood production, and International Paper needs this supply support structure to purchase the wood fiber we need to make our products. This pulpwood mill is also important in helping to sustainably manage the forests of upstate New York and Vermont by providing the market for low-grade wood that needs to be thinned and removed from the timber stands to, to, to promote forest health and regeneration. The natural gas pipeline will help ensure the long-term viability of this mill to operate in the Northeast, where the fuel demands and costs are more than other parts of the U.S. If we miss this opportunity to lower our fuel cost structure, this mill may no longer be able to compete with our other lower-cost international paper mills in the Southeast. If we were to lose this mill, such as others we have lost in New York in the past, such as Hudson River and DeFerriot, our communities and business network would be significantly impacted. This is why I encourage you to support this natural gas pipeline for the mill's long-term economic viability and the financial well-being of our communities in the Ticonderoga Basin. Thank you very much for this opportunity to comment. Thank you, Mr. Jingle. And uh, the, the new, hold, new holder of the last word for the hearing uh, is Melanie Pizer.
Thank you, sir. I was actually one of the first to fill out a card, so I was surprised not to hear my name. Um, there's been a lot of talk this evening and a lot of talk about international paper. Um, my best friend in childhood's father actually worked as a vice president for international paper. And I can tell you that I spent a lot of time on my banana seat bicycle looking at all of the little IP stickers I had glued onto my bike. I spent most of my childhood and high school years covering my textbooks with international paper textbook covers because I was so proud to have a friend who worked for them and frankly they were the best paper covers for textbooks that were around. I grew up outside of New York. I went to Colgate University in central New York and to Albany Law School. I'm a proud New Yorker whose parents decided to retire in Vermont because of the beautiful environment there. My farm, my parents' farm, much like Randy Barton's farm, is now threatened by the pipeline that's coming through and that's why I'm here to talk to you tonight. I'd like, though, to talk about the Section 68 requirements, because as I understood it, this hearing this evening was for, to help you to evaluate whether or not this project meets those requirements. Those requirements include two things. One, that the company is able and willing to render safe and adequate service. That's a question not about IP. That's a question about Vermont gas systems, and I'd like to tell you a little bit about what I think about that. First, in terms of safety. This is the largest project the Vermont Gas Systems admittedly has ever done. Just a couple of months ago, Vermont Gas Systems had to admit that it had underestimated the project management and security requirements for this project. It had to do that because of questions being asked. Not so long ago, Vermont Gas Systems learned from others that individuals not only using, but manufacturing and selling to their supervisors methamphetamines were doing the wells on their pipeline in Vermont. Neither Vermont Gas nor its contractor discovered that its own employees were doing this. They were only discovered because one of them tried to strangle the other one in the parking lot of the hardware store where they were buying the ingredients to manufacture meth. This company does not know how to manage a project of this size or how to ensure that its pipeline is being built safely. Imagine if similar individuals were charged with doing the work that's going to come under Lake Champlain to the IP plant. Let's not forget that if there's an explosion under the lake, that IP is actually in the incineration zone, as is my mother's home. Vermont Gas says in the flyer that it handed out here that it's been going to be using, quote unquote, the safest methods. That it has worked, its engineering team has worked with engineers to design the route and to design the construction that it plans to do here. Are you aware that the engineering firm, CHA, an Albany firm, has had most of its contract curtailed by Vermont Gas for performance problems? One might want to wonder whether or not the engineering that that firm already did is actually the quote unquote safest. I can tell you that Vermont Gas's quote unquote safest methodologies fail to recognize that there is existing contamination around utility poles on the properties running along the Velco right of way for the electric transmission line. Vermont Gas was mandated by our Public Service Board to develop a soil plan to address those issues. That soil plan has now been approved, yet there are soil scientists who squarely criticize that plan as not meeting not only best management practices, but even minimal industry standard management practices. I think it's important that your commission review very closely the safety claim, claims that are being made about the pipeline that is going to come under this lake. The second part of that criteria is adequacy, the ability to provide adequate service. The CEO of, of Vermont Gas's parent company, Gas Metro, Sophie Brochu, recently gave a speech in which she stated that if the Trans-Canada pipeline, which is near capacity and carries the fracked gas that comes from Alberta, Canada, to Vermont and would eventually, in principle, come here to New York, is under question. TransCanada would like to convert that pipeline to a tar sands pipeline, which would require significant construction. Ms. Brochu said that if that should happen, there will not be adequate gas for Quebec on peak days. IP is looking for an interruptible contract. There might not be any gas to provide to IP or to the community here, much less to Vermonters. 
In the annual report for Valinor and Gaz Metro for 2013, the company states in its risk section, that is the section that goes to the risks to the company's financial sustainability, to its revenues, and to its profit, in other words, its financial model, that should there be a significant risk or a significant increase in the transportation costs for natural gas from Alberta to Quebec, that that could mitigate the competitive advantage of the price of natural gas versus petroleum products in Vermont. It also said that it could disrupt the supply and cause a significant increase in price. Ms. Brochu similarly said that Quebecois residents could expect a 150% increase in the price of natural gas should the TransCanada plan come to fruition. You need to think very closely about whether the economic benefits are here for IP. Could IP get compressed natural gas via truck for a price that would ultimately be less, but also would be more secure because there are suppliers with which I believe International Paper is negotiating a contract outside of Boston that could actually provide US natural gas to IP coming from the south or from the east rather than depending on an insecure supply coming from Canada. And this brings me to the final point, which is that the question is whether one of the criteria is whether or not this company is economically and financially viable. I think you need to question that because the very risks that the company has stated itself, a drop in oil prices, we've seen a 33% drop over the past several months in oil, or a significant risk to the transportation or an increase in the transportation prices in Canada would significantly affect that company's bottom line. I can tell you that we don't want a pipeline through our property. I can tell you we don't want a pipeline that's going to dig up my mother's home and put her at permanent risk beginning at the age of 80 if that pipeline is not actually going to deliver any gas to anyone. We don't want an abandoned pipeline, but we certainly don't want our home devalued or made unsafe in order to provide gas that may not ever come to fruition. Vermont Gas, and I suggest that you ask a question, cannot guarantee supply contracts from Canada beyond the beginning of 2016. I hope you will take these into account as you evaluate the criteria under Section 68. Finally, I just want to say one thing. As I was listening to the gloom and doom from the people who presented here, and as far as I could tell, there was not one who was not in some way connected to international paper or to the leadership of a town. I didn't hear a single independent citizen speak this evening in favor of this pipeline. There were people who said, I'm speaking here as both a citizen and an employee of IP, or both a citizen and a member of a select board or of another body. But as I listened to that gloom and doom, all I could think of was, this reads like an Ann Tyler novel, where things just get worse and worse and worse. The fact is, is that only 16 Vermonters work at IP. Over 9,000 New Yorkers work in Vermont. I'm pretty sure we can absorb another 600. Please, come to Vermont. We're a lot happier and a lot more optimistic about our future than the leaders who are supposed to give you jobs are here. Please, we'll figure out a way to hire you if you don't allow this pipeline to go through. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pfizer. We have one, oh, one more speaker, maybe one more. Good evening. My name is Jim Major, and I'm a resident of Thai. I had no intention of speaking tonight except after the last speaker, who complained that nobody had spoken who had nothing to do with the mill. I've never worked for the mill. My dad never worked for the mill. My kids never worked for the mill. My grandfather didn't. My grandmother didn't. 
Nobody in my family has ever worked for the mill. We are interlopers. We came up from the south for summer vacations and love this area. I moved in permanently about 10 years ago. I'm not sure that I'm still fully accepted by Ty because I haven't worked for the mill. <laughs> but I love this area and I've tried to do things for the town. I've tried to restore some buildings downtown with my own money. I recognize what would happen to this town if that mill ever collapsed. I've talked to people in mill towns where the mills collapsed and they've experienced alcoholism, they've experienced suicides, they've experienced absolute financial devastation. This mill is critical to this town. The speaker from Crown Point so elegantly, eloquently pointed out that the mill was a stink pot in the 50s and 60s. I remember as a kid when the wind went the wrong direction sitting in Hearts Bay on Lake George having to smell that. They have done a wonderful job over the years with technology in cleaning up their act. This gas pipeline is the next step. And yes, there'll be another step after that. The fear mongering doesn't do a damn bit of good for the air quality. What does good for the air quality is reducing the number, the pollutants that are going into the air, which is exactly what this project will do. I also feel for the homeowners and the landowners that are subject to the pipeline and the fears they may have. I think the fears it's easy for me to say that those fears are um, unsubstantiated. But they, they have those fears, I recognize those fears, and I accept they have those fears. This is such an overwhelming project for this town, I can't imagine it being turned down. I would encourage those people who have these fears to talk some more to engineers and scientists. I'm very minimally aware of underground drilling, sewer lines that go in. When a sewer line goes in, people have fears that what if the sewer line ruptures? What are they going to do in this process? What's neat about it, they disturb nothing. I have an underground water line that went in, and I marveled at this drilling process. They went under my property without disturbing a darn thing. I really encourage that this be passed quickly. It's a lifesaver, and it's the beginning of bringing natural gas to other residents in other towns as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Major. We have one more speaker. Before I call the speaker's name, uh, would anyone who is even a little bit contemplating speaking <laughs> please raise your hand? Okay, then I'm going to declare this is actually the final speaker, and it's Mr. Edward Wojcik. Well oh, thank you. Good evening, Judge. Uh, everyone. Uh, wasn't planning to speak here, it's a little extemporaneous. I'll try not to get too excited. Uh, I was also born at Moses Ludington at the top of the hill, as Tom was, uh, but I was not as fortunate as he is to find a way to stay here uh, shortly before we got out of high school. The mine in Mineville closed and I had to come up with another life plan. So off to school I went, came back here, spent a year or so looking for employment within 50 to 100 mile radius, nothing was available. I was either underexperienced or overqualified. So off I went for a couple decades in the United States Air Force. Wonderful experience, highly recommend it. And then I uh, met a local girl near Omaha, got married, went to work for uh, the pipelines out there. Uh, Northern Border Pipeline was the, the main line that I supported. Um, concentrate on the most salient aspect of that was just as I came online, we were drilling a hole under the Mississippi River 
between Davenport, Iowa and Rock Island, Illinois. That's a little over a mile underneath, uh, in bedrock, underneath one of our uh, swiftest, largest volume rivers. And uh, they've been operating us safely ever since. Um, Fortunately, I was laid off about six years ago, and the first thought I had in mind, once that local girl from Omaha didn't like me anymore, was to come back here to the hills. That had always been my plan to never leave here, so it's nice to be back. Um, but I hope that future generations don't have to leave here, possibly never to return, as I did. Um, let's keep that in mind while we're discussing all the other points here. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Mr. Watson. All right, with that, I want to, first of all, I want to thank you for some um, remarkably thoughtful uh, and informative comments that I think have greatly enriched the record for the commission. I also want to thank you very much for the consideration you've shown to all of the speakers, which has made this hearing go very, very smoothly. Uh, I want to remind you that this isn't the only opportunity you have to comment. If there's something you heard tonight that inspires you to comment, by all means, take advantage of the other ways we offer for you to submit your comments to the Secretary of the Commission. Uh, or if there's someone else you know that you think would like to comment, encourage them to do so. Um, with that, I thank you all very much for coming, and we are adjourned.